Hi. I'm here with another eight books, I think it's eight, um, that uh, I got from the library, picture books, and um, I'm going to review them in order from my uh, least favorite one to my most favorite one. Wait a second. Really? Dude. I didn't even notice this until just now. Uh, so when when I read these books, I, I, I when I um, I get a big old stack of them and I and I read through them and then as I read, I put them in a done pile and sort them by how I like them. This was the first one that I read, and, and every other subsequent book that I read, I liked better, so I put it underneath. I didn't even realize until just now that this is actually the top of my stack, meaning that this is my lowest rated book of the week. Um, I, I like this book, which means that this is my first video uh, where I don't have any negative reviews. These are all positive reviews from me, um, so that's interesting. Um, okay, so no negativity this time. I mean, they'll still be, you know, pros and cons, I guess, but yeah, uh, I like all these books. I recommend all of these books, so. Uh, this one's called Clever Little Witch by, um, oh, I don't really know how to pronounce that name too well. You can read that name. I don't necessarily want to... Uh... Uh, mess that up. Um, I don't know what the diacritics mean. Uh, one, the, um, I don't know. Uh, and illustrated by Hyewon Yum. Uh, Okie dokie. So, uh, first of all, the illustrations are so charming. The colors are super bright. Uh, the characters are super cute. They have these cute faces when they are expressing emotions, um, but also these adorable faces when they're just uh, neutral. Let's see, where's the... Can I get a picture of just their faces? <laughs> well, I guess they're almost always expressing emotions, but look at how adorable. But yeah, the colors are so bright. The line quality is really charming. The colorful, colorful pencil lines used here in the broom are really nice. I just like the like the wonky perspective on the book too, you know? Um, I think the lack of outlines in these colored pencil drawings uh, really helps the style. And also there's a little bit of like um, like a masking going on, masking over uh, textures underneath for certain plants and the trees and stuff. All together, you know, it, depicting like a jungle landscape, jungle island landscape, it's really nice. Um, so yeah, the Clever Little Witch. Um, it starts out with, I'm Little Lynn, the cleverest little witch on Mai Mai Island. The South Pacific uh, cultural vibe, which is really cool. And um, uh, this little girl's a witch. I always like child witches. Um, she's got a, a broom and, uh, and a little sidekick that is somewhat reminiscent of um, Kato from uh, Cardcaptor Sagra. And a little brother who drives her nuts and who she decides to make a spell to um, uh, get rid of eventually. Oh, but first she tries to give it away to all of these uh, folkloric creatures, to this troll under a bridge, um, to the... Uh, to the forest fairy queen who likes using baby's breath in her potions but uh, doesn't want the baby because dirty diapers make her sneeze like crazy. Um, I feel like uh, I'm not too well versed in the um, in the sort of cultural references that are being made here but I do get the sense that they are being made and I really like that. I like this um, sort of, uh, you know, like references to fairy tales that are, are, are not the fairy tales that were referenced in all the books that I read as a kid um, is, uh, is always fun. I like... Uh, other mythologies being worked into books that are, um, you know, uh, also original works, not actually just uh, attempting to verbatim depict uh, those fairy tales from the culture, but actually work those fairy tales into new stories uh, with a vibrant, bright, modern feel to them. Um, uh, you know, it's not like that's rare or anything, but I always like to see it when it happens. Um, uh, <laughs> like the, the creepy, this is the like myth mythical creatures, like... Uh, home here what is it the orphanage for lost magical creatures it's like some sort of scary clown in here um and a flying pig and these strange cute twins um yeah anyways uh, so it's got some a really charming sense of like vibrancy and life and uh, mythology of the uh island where it takes place on um and uh and anyway anyways once nobody takes her baby brother she starts casting spells on him uh uh, but she doesn't have the whole spell because it gets eaten by, I think, by the baby. Yeah. And then, um, but she says these really charming rhymes, like, from the tip of your nose to the top of your toes, splashy flips, puckered lips, let me hear those fishy sips. And um, she accidentally, she doesn't know how to do the spell right, so she turns them into all these different uh, animals, including a dragon in the end. Um, so it's just kind of like a, 
you know, meandering adventure story um, with a just a really charming aesthetic, a really charming sense of placement and of the like life of the uh, world that is depicted here. Um, and uh, so that's really fun. It's it's really fun to read. Um, if I had any criticisms for this book, it would kind of just be that it is very like point by point. Um, it doesn't uh, it doesn't really capture me uh, in any of its actual moments. It just kind of like here's what happened, and then, and then, and then, which to me is, like, maybe not the most uh, entertaining, um, but the but the energy of it, the vibe of it, the aesthetic of it, I think is enough to keep it afloat, so uh, not a big criticism. Okay, um, this one's called The Neon Monster. I hope I'm pronouncing that okay. Um, by Andrea Wang, and, or Andrea Wang. Uh, pictures by Alina Chow. Um, you've got some, well, I'll show you where does this not glare on the cover. Some very uh, adorable character design here. Most of the characters have the little dot eyes, um, but uh, the main character has these big glossy sparkly eyes. And I really just like her like gigantic head and uh, <laughs> tiny little neck and her little ponytail. I think she, the character design is just really charming all throughout this book to me. Um, so this is uh, one of those stories I mentioned in a, f a few videos ago, I think, um, this sort of like how I like to see um, books that uh, uh, incorporate details from uh, various world cultures or any any culture in the world um, without being like specifically just like you know, so, so many books that uh, highlight details of a specific culture uh, will do so through highlighting a, you know, just like here's what happens at the like, like, festivals of this culture, the, you know, religious events of this culture, etc., uh, instead of just daily life in that culture. Um, it just doesn't seem to be as often, at least um, in the books that are uh, have, I've encountered in my life or that I've seen in a lot of schools. Um, this is an example of a book that is definitely, um, like, uh, uh, communicating cultural concepts and cultural ideas and, uh, and, and, uh, putting them on display through talking about a cultural festival. Um, but I, but I like it. I don't think that that's bad. I just want to see the alternative, uh, even more than I do already. Um, but I also like this. And I actually think that as far as, um, depictions of a festival go, this is one of the most fun ways that you could possibly do it. So, uh, in this story, they're getting ready for the Lunar New Year. And, um, and, uh, as they're getting ready, the child asks, like, why do we have these traditions, fireworks, the color red, etc. And uh, she has it explained to her that it's because of the, you know, the legend of the neon monster here who um, was scared away by those things in, uh, during a new year in a, in a legend. And, um, and then the neon monster shows up like in modern day, while she's making the food for the festival, and she tries to scare it away with red and fireworks, and it's like, oh, that's old. I, I'm not, I'm not scared of those anymore. Um, and so instead of scaring him away, she, uh, she distracts him from his goal um, by uh, feeding him uh, day after day various, um, like, like filling him up so that he can't eat the people in the city or her uh, with the various traditional foods of that festival. Um, and so in that sort of uh, uh, cyclical storytelling structure, we get to just really naturalistically learn so many details about this festival, um, and and mostly about details of the foods, but also about all sorts of other little traditions. Um, in the end, they defeat him with fireworks and uh, that kind of thing. Um, and there's, uh, you know, there's little, uh, there's some vocabulary, some like Chinese vocabulary that's mixed in here. Um, and it's all just really entertainingly written. It's it's it is again kind of another uh, little like and then and then and then type story, but it's just so cleverly done. Um, there's so much information packed really naturalistically, so that you don't like feel like you're like just reading a textbook, but you are learning like so many so many details. Um, and uh, it really encapsulates like a a good healthy chunk of traditions, um, but all within the very much in context of this adventure story. So I thought that was really cool. Um, and if you like books about food, uh, this is a pretty great one. It goes into a lot of detail. There's a lot of drawings of food. There's a lot of descriptions of food um, and of the meaningfulness of those foods. Um, and overall, the you know art is just charming the whole time. Uh, so yeah, it's a fun story. And then um, in the back, of course, there's a nice author's note that explains uh, in a little bit more depth some of the uh, significance of some of these uh, pieces of culture that it represents. So I liked it. Um, the Tide by Claire Helen Welsh, illustrated by Ashling Lindsay. Um, 
this one is a story again with um you know a nice charming uh uh like no outlines colored pencil bright colors uh cute character design kind of art style um that uh, tells the story of um a young girl kind of um processing and dealing with the um the memory loss of her elderly grandfather um i feel like it does a really um kind and candid uh job of depicting uh this memory loss um it doesn't uh it, it it has a few moments where like that must be so scary uh and it says that a few more times than maybe it needs to um uh but it overall i th don't think uh really demonizes memory loss um which i think is good um i think that uh uh telling stories about that uh, in the context of accepting it and maybe even sometimes seeing like some of the beauty in it um because i've heard some discourse around that that i thought was uh, really compelling that there's you know this is part of the human condition and uh sure maybe it is scary from the perspective of certain people because it's a change um and and that's totally valid and i don't think it's wrong to acknowledge that but at the same time like there can be um there can be beauty in the change even if it's scary and I think that especially for a child like um processing it with a little bit of acknowledgement of that beauty as well is a positive thing um so uh it, mostly it takes place with these uh these scenes that happen there's not really a story um well I mean I guess there is it's more just like a series of uh, little scenes and in each scene she, the girl kind of has a chance to reflect on like uh some way that she relates um you know like uh, Grandpa loves me very much, but sometimes he gets confused. My mama says it must be annoying to forget how to do things, and I agreed. Like the time I couldn't remember how to tie my shoes, and my teacher helped me. So she kind of like relates to it. So I think it's kind of like helping children to relate to it as the idea, like readers of this. Um, but then they also just have these nice moments where they're just playing together. Um, I think uh, the the nice thing and the and my, my like the nice thing about this book, and also maybe the the my thing I don't like about this book so much is um the fact that the point of the book is like all of this um is happening to my grandpa but I still love him um like that does sound like a positive message and I do like that message uh overall but I also kind of um I kind of resent the but um uh, you know like I I I wish it could just be this is happening and <laughs> I love my grandfather. Um, sort of the implication that I love my grandfather in spite of his memory loss is a little weird to me. Um, and so that's my one kind of uh, complaint about this book. But overall, it, this book is mostly just really sweet. And um, and I think it's nice that we have uh, books that um, talk about, um, you know, the memory loss of uh, the grandparent. There's so many books about um, children dealing with the death of a grandparent, not that many dealing with this. So. I think that's interesting, and and it and it does kind of uh, you you really you really get a sense of you, I think as a reader you like the grandfather and um and 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 sympathize with or relate to the grandfather, which I think is a good tact to take with this, um, uh, not just uh, seeing him and pitying him, but also kind of relating to him and seeing his humanity. Um, and the book does kind of focus on that, like that's a focus of it. All right, this one's called Songs for Our Sons. I actually kind of want to, like, wait to review this until later uh, because um, it's kind of part of a pair. There's one called Songs for Our Daughters. So, um, you know what? Yeah, maybe I'll wait because there's things that I want to say about this book um, that I can't say without reading the other one. I'm really interested in seeing... Uh, the, the thing that I like about this book is uh, is a, sort of a good depiction of positive... Uh, non-toxic masculinity um, in, very, in, an, in an interesting way that I'd like to talk more about, but I think I'm going to save it because I would like to compare it to I'm really interested to see how their other one Songs for Our Daughters, I think it's called um, uh, like which things it has in common with this book and which things it doesn't because that'll kind of tell me something about what they considered masculinity that they put in this book um, and that'd be an interesting perspective to have while talking about it, so I'm going to leave this one out actually um and I'll review it, uh, hopefully, in the future, because I did like it. Uh, it's really well written. Um, speaking of non-toxic masculinity, though, here's another great one. This is uh, by the one and only Dion Warwick, and it's illustrated by David Freeman Woolley. Oh, no, it's not. Sorry. It's illustrated by Fred William. Uh, it's by Dion Warwick and David Freeman Woolley, who, uh, I guess, wrote this together. Uh, it actually includes an exclusive CD narration by Dion Warwick, um, which... 
uh, I totally forgot to listen to. So that's sad, and I might have to um, add into this video later with what I thought of that if I uh, can listen to that after recording this. Um, anyways, it's called Little Man. Um, I feel like the art style is not uh, too much to speak of. It's a pretty simplistic, um, sort of realistic art style. Um, but it's just, I don't know, it's just really charming, uh, both as a depiction of, um, like a, a, like a young boy and, and kind of like, I don't know, it's not too focused on his masculinity per se, but you know, it's, it's, it definitely, definitely has a boyish vibe, but in a, um, in a, in a really great, uh, like, uh, a really great way that like supports um, this idea of boyishness that uh, that where he's you know emotional and um, and engages socially and uh, and is a part of his community, which I think uh, is left out of a lot of the more negative depictions of boyhood. I guess um, not necessarily, but that's kind of my impression. <laughs> Anyways, I may be saying that with a little bit not enough education on the subject. Um, Anyways, uh, it's about a boy who notices that everybody in his community uh, has something that they like to do, and his is play the drums. He he has um, a bike that he wants to buy, but he uh, and that's kind of like the sort of light. I almost call it a B plot. It's sort of the like the conflict of the story, though. Um, he wants the bike. He doesn't have the money. He he works all summer. He does all these things, but he still doesn't have enough money. Um, anyways, and then it focuses on I think the main event, which is his drumming. Uh, he loves to drum. It's his biggest passion, but he's not very good at it. Um, the his friends do tease him for it, um, but overall the story's tone doesn't um, linger very much on this idea that he's not very good at it. It doesn't uh, linger on him feeling bad about it or him beating himself up about it. He doesn't feel insecure about it per se. He is even shown just rolling his eyes when his friends tease him, and he just keeps on at it. And it's not like he keeps on at it in spite of feeling like he can't do it because he was teased. He just does feel like he's going to keep on doing it. And, and that's just how it is, which I, I really liked. I liked the straightforwardness of that. Um, it's a little moment where his dad talks about, like, finding your purpose and how you should keep on drumming. And I decided to have a talk with Dad. Dad, drums are my thing, and I want to get better. And, you know, it's not like, drums are my thing, but I suck at it. <laughs> uh, drumming is your passion, he says. It's what your dreams are made of. You should never give up on your dreams. Um, you know, the dad's telling that message, but the, the kid never said he was giving up on his dreams. And I think that's an important point. But anyways, the message is still good. Um, anyways, uh, this is interesting to me. There's a theme of the three P's, passion, purpose, and perfection. I rarely see perfection be acknowledged as a, as a reasonable goal within children's media. And I personally, as a perfectionist child, uh, I, I appreciate that as somebody who was a perfectionist child. Um, anyways, it's just about him like working and working on his, uh, on his drums until he becomes good enough to play at the like neighborhood barbecue. And it's just a, there's a solid sense of community. There's a solid sense of reality to it. And, uh, and the writing style is charming and told from first person perspective. And so, um, I don't know, it just, it just, it has a wholesome vibe to it, you know, just like, like a story about a kid who's like gonna keep just gonna you know just gonna keep on doing it just gonna keep on doing what he's passionate about just because like why wouldn't you just because that's what you do um so <clears throat> hope this hopefully this works i'm just gonna bring you over to the other room um i've got uh dion warwick reading little man the story just starts out i thought this was really interesting um the, with like it just starts out with the text of the book she just immediately press play and it starts on the first words of the book it doesn't say this is little man as read by, you know. <laughs> um, anyways, just listen to how great this woman is. The more I play the drums, the better I get to know them. That makes them kind of like friends. Boom, 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 boom. That's the big old bass drum. Rat-a-tat, a rat-a-tat. The snare drum sounds like it's slapping when I hit it right. And when I need a ping, or a crash, I can always count on the cymbals. My favorite part is putting them all together. Boom, boom, rat a tat, ping, ping, crash. Um, let's see track two. Hi, my name is David Freeman Woolley. When I was a kid, I was simply known as Little Man. Oh, so Today, it's based on him. I would like to do my thing and discuss some of the components of a drum set. For example, a bass drum sounds like this. So it's got a demonstration of the drums on the CD, which I think is so cute. This would be such a great book and CD to get the for a drum, drum sounds like this. 
Okay, this one's called Sunflower Lion. Man, this one is so simple. I just like it because it's got this almost Sanrio-esque charm to it. It's just cute. It's just cute. As you can tell by the pictures, it's just adorable. Um, I think it's really cute that this book is divided into chapters. Chapter one, because they're so short. This is the sun. Can you see it? The sun is in the sky. It is shining. It is as bright as a flower. That's chapter one. There's like seven chapters in here. They're all that short. Uh, it's just really sweet. Um, the lion runs home. Can you see him? No, you can't. He's running too fast. <laughs> so there's some humor in the simplicity to me, and uh, but it's just adorable. I don't know what to say. You might think this is a book for toddlers. I think this is a book for all ages because I thought it was really charming and adorable. But, you know, there's not much to say beyond that. Uh, uh, I'll keep my description as simple as the book, or try to. Um, Home in the Woods by Eliza Wheeler. Man, I was really caught off guard by this book. I kind of got the sense starting out that I wasn't going to love this book, that it was going to be boring or pretentious or, you know, overworked or something. But, um, but no, it's really good. Um, the art is, uh, surprisingly quite charming. Um, some of it is maybe a little bit creepy. Uh, the, the characters, the character design is a little bit creepy, uh, a little doll-like, um, but the colors, I think, are really gorgeous. And that only gets better uh, as the seasons pass. And I love this gigantic typography that begins each season. The story is sort of divided into the seasons. But it isn't, it isn't a book that's focused on the changes of the seasons. It's a book that's focused on the, um, on the sort of daily life throughout the year of this family. Um, it's a family who, the it, you know, it's implied to be some long time ago-ish, uh, but definitely in the United States, uh, you know, with um, white people, uh, so not that long ago. Um, and, uh, and the dad has died of cancer. Uh, well, it doesn't say cancer until the end. I'll explain that a bit. But the dad has died. They acknowledge that right away. And it's, so it's a single mom with tons of kids. Um, and they move into this tiny little broken down shack in the woods so obviously they don't have much money um so it's a uh, it's an account of how they find this shack to live in and there's a map with it's labeled and they and they uh they discover unbeknownst to them that there is uh like the the makings of a food store uh uh in the basement underneath the floorboards they fix up the house they kind of talk about how depressing it is all throughout, there's these gorgeous moments of nature, um, and it focuses on that. It focuses on the work that they do as they move into the house, and then it focuses on the the ways that they enjoy their life at the same time. They uh, run through the forest and the games that they play, and then it goes back to things that they have to do to survive. Um, sometimes mixing them together, here they are having fun while picking berries because they have to scrounge for food in the wild in order to get by. Um, autumn comes and here are the activities, the work that they have to do in order to get by, in order to survive. Um, here they are making uh, uh, canned food uh, to put into their larder. Um, they go into town, you know, just kind of a little slice of life. And uh, the thing that happens as you start to read the story is that you're like, wow, this is a lot of specific details. It's, a really, lot of, it's, it's, it's really just like, it almost reads like the diary of an actual historical person. Like, here's what we did, here's what we did. Uh, you know, these are it doesn't start it, it's all written from a third person perspective but it starts to sound like somebody saying these were my experiences um because it manages to mix in uh you know very believable like normal life things with uh moments of like enjoyment and play that add like depth and realism to the moments of hardship and uh and and sort of out of the ordinary like work of survival that these people have to do to do their situation of poverty um Plus all these gorgeous pictures of nature. I was really moved by that picture of the house in the in the woods. There was like stories that came to my mind when I saw that. Anyways, you get that impression and it turns out to be true. Um, by the end of the story, you get... Oh man, look at the colors of the spring panel. Oh, so pretty. Um, so pretty. Anyways, uh, at the end, there's this description of the basis of this story. In the fall of 1932, during the Great Depression, when my grandma Marvel was six, her family was evicted from their home in Bennett, a small town in northern Wisconsin. Her father, a munitions factory worker, began moving their belongings into an abandoned tar paper shack deep in the woods, but he died of cancer before being able to spend a single night there. Um, so this story is actually like told uh, by the granddaughter of the people in the story, um, and the 
and the kids in the story are actually still alive. At the time of this writing, four of the eight siblings from this book are still with us. Uh, Eva, 87 years old, Lowell, 91 years old, Marvel is 93, and Rich is 97. Um, my grandma wants you to know that their favorite game, which I called General Store in this book, was really called That Game. And so, like, all the details are actually from stories that this, uh, that this author's grandmother told them, um, which is crazy cool to me, and it really came across in the story. I knew that before I came to the author's note. Um, there's just a, just a sense of lived-in-ness uh, of these stories, the way that they mix the mundane and the silly and the fun with the survival um, so uh, I, I loved it. Uh, it was it really created a created a world. It really felt like a like I could step into a life there, which is cool. Um, this last one is called "Ask Me" by Bernard Weber, illustrated by Susie Lee, who uh, wrote "Wave" and uh, what was the other one? Uh, the the ice skating one that I liked. <laughs> That's the one I like better, and I still can't remember the name of it. Um, I'll put it up on the screen. Um, yeah, that one. Um. Okay, so really charming illustrations here. I just like this uh, artist's art style. Here's an example of something that's done with a lot of, you know, movement and sketchiness to the pencil and yet doesn't feel rushed. It feels like it's done with care and design and interest in what was being done here with this sort of, you know, the partially done tree with the swirls of line. I, I just really like uh, the way that Susie Lee uses line in her art. Um, the dialogue of this book is... Um, uh, very, it's just a conversation. There's not a narrative. There's just a conversation. It's back and forth um, dialogue. Uh, and it's dialogue between, I, I don't know, a dad or maybe an older brother um, and the younger girl. And um, and it uh, felt authentic, and that's why I liked it. Um, it doesn't really have much of a story. It just uh, is sort of uh, almost... Um, an analysis or a showcase of authentic dialogue between a young person and an older person, which I just find really compelling and interesting. Um, I could give you an example, I guess. Um, the the child is uh, is um, prompting the adult to ask specific questions. So the child is like, I want to answer this question, but they're not asking it. So they ask them to ask the question, and then they get asked the question, and then they answer it, which is like, I don't know, very, I, I know that that's a thing that happens. Like, that's, that's a fun, like, very childlike, like, observant, ob um, a good observation of, like, how children speak that's demonstrated in this book. Ask me what I like. What do you like? I like dogs. I like cats. I like turtles. I like geese. Geese in the sky or geese in the water? I like geese in the sky. No, in the water. I like both. Ask me what else I like. What else do you like? I like frogs. I like frogs swimming and frogs hopping. I like bugs. Insects? No, bugs. More books should be uh, examinations of the of the idiosyncratic way that real people talk, you know? Not just dialogue that gets the point across, but like dialogue that specifically demonstrates how people talk weird and people talk in their own ways. And uh, and that can be really interesting. And, and just having an examination of that in a book was something that was really worthwhile to me, um, uh, even without much of a story to it. But there is some like charming moments of like, you know, like uh, the bonding between the family members. They talk about the kid's birthday and how like they'll never forget it. And um and it's and it's sweet and heartwarming because of that. But uh, but also just from a linguistic standpoint, I guess I, I really enjoyed reading that book. I uh, want more things like that. Uh, uh, compelling humanistic dialogue. Humanistic, the right word? Just human dialogue, you know. Okay. Anyways, that's all I've got for today. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week. Bye.